Good morning, friends from Heritage Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us for another one of our video services as we try to worship together and look into God's word together. I hope that this is profitable for you. How have you been enduring the quarantine? Hope you've done well. I know we Wagners have actually enjoyed it to some extent. We've been able to play lots of games together. We've been able to sit and talk over things that we quite often talk about, but we have extended times to be able to do that, so we're enjoying it. I'm wondering what other things have come up for you during the quarantine. Let me give you an example. Here's one thing that I thought I would never be able to show to you, and that is that we have a face mask collection. Did you ever think you'd have a face mask collection? I just didn't think that that would happen. We started off with something like this. This is one that I believe we bought a while back to use when you're using cleaning chemicals and so forth, just to help breathe and protect yourself from that. But since the whole COVID-19 has come up, uh, we've been thinking about other types of masks to wear. And actually, Barb Domsic made a couple masks for us. She brought this one over. This is for Len. And uh, this one here is for me. And we're grateful for those. In fact, I believe she made one for Whitney too, but I don't have it here with me. Uh, we've got other masks also at work. Uh, my, my boss's wife actually made several face masks for us to wear at work while we're around customers. Uh, I actually uh, took one for Lynn because I like the way that this particular one felt. And this is one that I brought home for Lynn and she's worn it a few times out in the grocery store and so forth. I really like mine. It makes me want to go hunting. It's camouflage. Isn't that pretty good? I it, it is weird, I'll say, as you go into a grocery store or into a gas station and you're wearing a mask. Remember in times past where the gas stations would all say to the snowmobilers, you must remove your helmet and your mask before you come in the store. And now they're encouraging you to wear these things. Well, we have a collection and who knows, by the time it's all over, we may have a larger collection. Well, that's this pandemic that we're all having to endure as we're in quarantine. I hope it's going well for you. And I'd be interested in seeing what kind of collections maybe that you've come up with as you uh, continue enduring this time. What I'd like us to do is go ahead and pray, and then we'll get into a time of worshiping together through song, and then we have a few other surprises for you during this video. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, thank you that even though it's by video, even though it's uh, online, uh, we can still enjoy being together in this way, especially as we sing. Help us to lift our hearts in praise to you. As we look at your word, I pray that you would help us to each pray and ask you to teach us and to uh, open our hearts to the different truths that you have for us. Bless us, Father, as we do this. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing our first song together, A Servant's Heart.
I hope you're enjoying the music that we're using. I hope that you know the songs. I know those of us that attend regularly have been singing all of these songs for quite some time now, and we're able to sing along with them. Uh, if you don't know the song, maybe you could look it up, uh, Google it, and uh, find a version of it online or at YouTube, and uh, learn the song, and then sing with us. It's a wonderful way to worship the Lord together. I have a surprise for you now. I know some of you are expecting this, but I have been trying to come up with a way that we can still enjoy each other even though we can't be together as it would be normally during our church services. So I've been asking some of you to give me some videos of a greeting that you would have for the church. And I'd like to share some of those with you now. Now we've got way too many to do today. It would take up our whole time. But I do have several that I would like to share with you where uh, our fellow church members are enjoying the quarantine together and enduring and they want to say hello to you. Also, our last one is a bit of, of a surprise from one of our more distant members. I hope you enjoy them. Hey everybody, it's the Quackenbushes. Hi, uh, we miss all of you. Uh, we wish you a very happy and blessed Easter. Uh, we'll get through this. Uh, love you all. Love you guys. See you in a few weeks. Bye. Hello to all of our HBC church friends and family. Hi everybody. We just wanted to uh, do this video that Pastor requested to let everybody know that we're okay, and uh, we're working on stuff around the house and staying safe. Just grubbing around. You can tell by looking at us, we've just been grubbing. <laughs> so just going to the grocery store, and that's about all we're doing. Yep, uh, we are working a little bit on the house and doing some things around the yard when we get a chance when the weather cooperates. But uh, we just want to remind everybody that uh, you, know, you need to stay safe and you, you need to be strong. Um, the Lord's with us, and obviously this is the time of the year that we have to remember that he went to the cross and, and died there for our sins, and he did that voluntarily. So, um, And then the, the really neat thing is after three days, he rose again, and all of our sins are forgiven as long as we believe in him. So from the Green family to all of our Heritage Baptist Church family. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. And we're thinking about all you and we're praying for you every day. We love you. Love you. Bye. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm still, I'm at work. I'm having to wear the mask, the gown, the gloves for just about everything we do. So hopefully you guys are staying safe and enjoy this time at home and look forward to seeing you again soon. Hey there, Heritage Homies. How are you all doing today? We're coming at you live at the Hunt Hideaway. It's Bruce and Heather saying hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone. We miss you. Miss you. We're doing well. The dog wants to be in the video with us. <laughs> we're both we're both doing well right now. Um, trying to figure out work schedules, trying to figure out schooling, all that good stuff, but. Um, Obviously, we're not practicing our uh, social distancing very well, are we? Uh, so anyway, just thought we'd have a little touch out and shout out to you. So be well, be safe, and we'll see you when we see you. Hello, everybody. This is Lois, and I am missing everybody. It's pretty sad that we can't be together, but there will be a day when we'll be able to get together and see everybody have good church service with everyone there. Hope you're having a good time, even though it, we are separated. But hope to see you soon. Goodbye. Oh. Hi, everyone. Hope everybody's doing well. Miss you all and think of you a lot. Uh, I love you all and have a nice day. And don't you like my hair? <laughs> Now we're going to turn to a more serious part of our of our video service, and that is we're going to look at the Word of God. But before we do that, I'd like us to sing the song Ancient Words together. And this is a song that's praising God for the scriptures and how the scriptures uh, teach us, even though they are ancient, they're still relevant for today. Let's sing this one together.
Well, let's open God's ancient word and study together today. Um, I have been considering what to do as this um, uh, pandemic uh, continues on and we're quarantined for a longer period of time. As you know, the first few messages uh, dealt with other topics with us uh, enduring this time. But I've been thinking, Lord, what do you want me to do? What would you have me to uh, bring to all of our folks as we study your word together? There is, of course, a series that I was doing before this all got started. And that is we were looking at the book of Ephesians together. And so I asked the Lord, do you want me to continue doing Ephesians? I considered other ideas. I looked at other passages of scripture and so forth. But I'll be honest with you, the more that I looked into those other things and the more I asked God for wisdom, I've just settled on the book of Ephesians. I believe he's given me a piece about that. And I think the Lord would have us to continue our study with that. So that's what we're going to do. Well, let me just give you a quick review. So far, we've gone through chapters one and two in the book. And what they primarily dealt with, and, and I'm going to break it down just uh, quickly, but it, they primarily dealt with our salvation. Paul was uh, letting the Ephesians know that they had a lot to praise the Lord for, for their individual salvation. And if you remember, we looked at the idea that the Father was involved, the Son was involved, and the Spirit was involved. The, the Trinity was involved in our salvation as God drew us to himself so that we could turn to him for eternal life. And then as we got into chapter 2, Paul started looking at it from the broader perspective of the group that we are, and that is most of us would be Gentiles. And in chapter 2, Paul is dealing with the idea that uh, God is doing something different now as opposed to just working through Israel. Now he is doing something different where the Israelites and the Gentiles are joined together into one body, something that they wouldn't have seen coming. And that's what God is doing. And he showed all the reasons why we can praise the Lord for that. Well, with that said, we're getting into chapter 3. So I'd like us to go there. But as we do, let me begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you again for your word. I pray that you would teach us and uh, bring us closer to you as we grow in knowledge. And Lord, we understand that knowledge is important. It's not just having your spirit in us, but you desire us to know your truths. That's why you revealed them to, the, to us through the scriptures. And Lord, I pray that you would do that today as we begin this look at chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as Paul was teaching these uh, ideas in chapter 2 and in chapter 1, now he comes to chapter 3 and he's going to start praying for us. You might not notice that if you just do a cursory reading through it, but let me show you what I mean. Paul began in chapter 3 by saying, or, or giving the idea that he's starting to pray for them. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. He says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles... And then he's going to diverge from that for a moment. He actually picks up his prayer in chapter four, or in verse 14 of chapter 3, where he says, For this reason I bow my knees, and he continues on with his prayer. But the question is, is why would Paul diverge from his prayer? Or why would he be interrupted from this particular prayer? Um, you'll see later when we look at the prayer uh, itself from verse 1 and then into verses 14 through 19 that Paul is, is going to pray that we understand these things and we grow in spiritual knowledge. But what was it that interrupted him? What caused him to stop and think for a minute well, and, and, and be distracted, if you will? Now, I know the Holy Spirit has inspired him to write and has caused it to be written this way. But from a human standpoint, what do you suppose caused him to be distracted and to go into this parentheses of sorts? I was reading one fellow who was writing on this and he made an interesting comment. He says, I wonder if maybe as Paul was beginning to pray, he suddenly heard his chains jingle and it reminded him that he was a prisoner. That's right. Ephesians is a prison epistle and Paul was in prison as he was writing to them. And something may have made him remember that he was a prisoner. Well, why is that such a distraction to his prayer? Well, it may have raised a couple issues in Paul's mind. Just consider these issues. First of all, Paul may have wondered, how can the Ephesians make sense of the fact that I'm in prison right now? You know, they may have said he was serving God. Why did he get put in prison? They may have said he was establishing churches and doing the Lord's will that way. Why was he put in prison? 
And so Paul, I think, wants to help them to make sense of that. But another issue also comes up throughout the book of Ephesians, and that is there were people who were enemies of the gospel, and they were enemies of Paul's ministry. And so these enemies were using Paul's uh, prison uh, circumstances to discredit him and to draw away from his ministry and, to, and so forth. Uh, they might be saying, how could he be from God? If he was really from God, why would God allow him to be in prison? Why would God allow this very negative circumstance if he really was from God? Um, is it possible that God's trying to stop him from doing what he was doing? So Paul was keenly aware of those things, and he wanted the Ephesians, I think, to think through those. Think about it in our situation. Don't we sometimes question God when he uses uh, certain things or allows certain things in our lives that are maybe unpleasant or things that we don't understand? We might say, aren't I trying to live for God? Why would he allow this to come into my life? We might say, how could this be God's purposes? I just don't see where that makes any sense. Consider this COVID-19 situation where we're in this uh, quarantine right now. You might be asking, how does this make any sense at all? Well, keep that thought in mind as we continue to go through this. You might also hear people attacking God when they see things like that. Some people might say, well, if God really loved you, why would he allow you to go through this thing? Or why would he allow that to be happening to you? Some people might say, how could a good God really let these things happen? I, I, I must admit, when I hear people say that, especially that last one, how could a good God allow this? that it just makes me think that obviously people who are asking that question aren't thinking deeply enough into all of the circumstances. I mean, when Adam and Eve sinned, didn't God place them and the environment under the curse? We know right from the beginning of the scriptures that things are going to happen that are going to be unpleasant. And it's all because of the fact that we as a human race are sinners. Well, at, at any rate, we ask those same questions as Paul is wondering if they're asking about him. So I believe that's one of the reasons why Paul uh, makes a break. Again, maybe he heard that chain jingle and he thought, you know, I, they're thinking about my imprisonment. Let's talk about it for a moment. Well, as Paul starts to pray, he digresses. Well, why does he digress from the prayer? First of all, it's an important issue. He's going to talk more about the idea that the Gentiles and the Jews are placed into one body. It's an important issue. And he, even though he just talked about it through the end of chapter 2, it, it's weighing so much on his mind that I think he wants to make sure that they understand that. So it is an important issue. And besides, when he does actually pray, he's going to pray that that believers would understand that issue and believers would be able to see how great and awesome God's works are and how, how uh, difficult they can be to understand at times. And so I think he wants, again, to diverge a little bit and digress so that he could explain some of these things. And that's what he does here in uh, chapter 3, really from verses 2 through 13. He's going to rehearse what he just talked about in chapter 2, verses 11, and so forth. He's going to reemphasize that. Now, he does something interesting in verse 2. I want you to notice that. Let me read. Uh, Paul, I'll start at verse 1 again. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Now, you need to think about that statement there. Paul just got finished talking about that, this, this dispensation of grace. He just got talking about what it is that God is doing and, and that God has given him this ministry to make this known. And so he makes that statement, if indeed you've heard. Well, if we were to put it in a in a uh, the language that we speak sometimes when we're not trying to be proper, he says, well, you may have heard. You may have heard about this. He's using sarcasm, I think. Because, again, he just said it. But you may have heard this, and it's a theme that he's repeated many times, that God has given me this ministry. And uh, he, he's, he's going to then go deeper into that. He's going to say, first of all, God has revealed a mystery to me. Now, again, he's already said it. He said it in uh, chapter 1. I'd like to read a couple verses for you, just so that you remember where we've already been. Chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. 
So see, he's saying God has brought us this mystery. He's revealed this mystery. And then you go to chapter 2, where he was teaching more in depth on exactly what that mystery was. Look at verse 11 and following. He says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were, who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, that's a big deal to Paul. This is what God is doing. And people need to understand this. You, you know, he's gotten a lot of opposition from people we would refer to as Judaizers. They're, they're people who are trying to say, uh, yes, Jesus is the Messiah, but he's doing it through Israel and everyone else needs to be proselytes to Judaism and, and join Israel and obeying all the rules and regulations and so forth. And Paul's showing that's not the case. Jesus is offering us salvation by grace through faith. And that's what he's trying to get across here. So he's trying to say God has revealed this mystery to us. You remember what a mystery is? A mystery, as Paul refers to it, is a truth that has not been revealed to anyone yet. Now, in the Old Testament scriptures, there's bits and pieces of this truth that have been revealed. For instance, when God gave the covenant to Abraham, uh, he, he told them that uh, through you and your family, all the families of the earth would be blessed. So we see bits and pieces like that. But it's not until we get to the New Testament that this doctrine is opened up and this doctrine is made fully clear to everyone. And it was to Paul. And, and that's one of the first things he wants to say here in verses three, four, and five. He wants to say that, look, God has revealed this mystery to me, but not just to me, he's revealed it to the other apostles and prophets that are in the church as well. Let me show you. Let's read those verses, verses three through five. He says, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written about already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mysteries of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. And as you know, when we study the book of Acts, you can see that as the church began, I believe in Acts chapter 2, that what their practice was is to gather around with the apostles and the prophets and to hear the teaching that God has laid on their hearts and given to them. And that's where the, the truths of the New Testament unfold. And of course, the New Testament scriptures are uh, God's truths unfolding from the prophets and the apostles and so forth. That's why we revere them as the word of God. So Paul says, these truths have been re revealed to me and the apostles and prophets. And then he says, and in fact, God has gifted me with this particular ministry, meaning Paul himself. God's actually gifted him with that. Let's read verses seven through nine. Paul says, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying, God has gifted me this ministry. I find it interesting that the wording that he uses there is similar to the wording he uses later when he talks to Christians about their spiritual gifts and that God has given them this grace. And that's a term that would be used towards spiritual gifts. And in Paul's case, this is a specific ministry that's given for him that he has to do. And so it's a gift from God and it's part of the, the uh, spiritual gift, spiritual ministry that God is pushing him out into. But he mentions a couple things in verses eight and nine. First of all, he says, part of the ministry God has given me is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. We could spend many sermons just dealing with the topic of the unsearchable riches of Christ. But just take it that Paul is talking about all of this put together. Uh, Paul has been given the opportunity to preach that. But then he says something else in verse 9. He says that he has been able to make all see. 
this hidden ministry. Let me show you what I mean. He says in verse 9, the first part of that, he says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, uh, which from the beginning of the ages God has done. So he's saying, God wants me to make all see that. Now I want to ask this question, why? Why is it so important that God wants Paul to make all see that? And, and I know that there's some obvious things, but there's also some things that are a little less obvious that I would like to uh, point out in just a minute. Let me read verse 10 through 12, where Paul says this is what God wants him to do by revealing this min mystery to everyone else. Look at verse, uh, verse 10. Paul said, to the intent, or so that, or for this reason, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in which we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Well, I want you to pay especially attention to verse 10. This is, this is an interesting verse. He says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. God's manifold wisdom, his, his multifaceted wisdom, his great awesome wisdom. I think sometimes we fail to realize just how awesome God really is. God is above us and beyond us. And I think sometimes we as theologians get in trouble because we try to put everything in a nice, neat box. And, and I believe God has given us lots of truth to be able to do that, to be able to categorize and so forth. But there's no way we could ever cover it all. There's no way that we could ever comprehend it all. Uh, God's wisdom is, is, is a manifold and, and above and beyond us. But what he's saying here is he wants everyone to be able to see what God is doing so that God's great wisdom can be manifested by the church. God is using the church to make known his great wisdom, the wisdom of his plan, the wisdom of what he began to do. Rem remember how God works all this. God wants to show grace and mercy, but at the same time, he wants to show holiness and and justice and God has put together the perfect plan to be able to do just that and he began by working through the the Israelites the nation of Israel and the Jews and I believe God had certain lessons in that and certain things he was trying to get across but in the end he draws it all together and brings all the peoples of the earth together so that Gentile and Jew are together in one body truly the body of Christ so who is it that God wants us to make this manifest to? As these verses continue, he says to make, to make these things known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Who's that talking about? Well, if I were to ask you, who does God want the church to show his great wisdom to? You might begin by saying, well, to all mankind to everyone on the earth. And, and I would agree with you there. We certainly would find plenty of places in the scriptures that would say that we're showing God to the rest of the world. And we would call that evangelism. However, that's not what he's saying here. What Paul said here was he wants uh, that wisdom to be made known to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Do you know who he's talking about? He's talking about angels. When he uses this phrase, principalities and powers, and I would challenge you to uh, Google that or to use a, a, a Bible study and go and look up that phrase uh, throughout the scriptures, he's talking about angelic powers. Now, this can be both holy angels or it can be wicked angels. We would refer to them as demons. But God is showing them something through us as the church. Uh, let me show you a couple ideas. Um, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter's actually talking about the prophets who have prophesied and God used them to bring forth the scriptures and other uh, biblical truth to us. Uh, but he goes beyond that. Let me look at uh, verse 12 of 1 Peter 1. He says, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, meaning the prophets, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been uh, reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then he goes on to say, things which angels desire to look into. Think about that. 
These prophets were proclaiming uh, how God was reaching out to us for salvation, the gospel, the grace and mercy and so forth. And he says, these are things which angels desire to look into. And, and I believe he's referring to holy angels, that the holy angels desire to look into what is this grace about? I don't want to get into the, the history of angels, but the argument could be made that holy angels have never experienced grace because they've been holy from the time they were created. Uh, some fell, they became demonic forces, but the holy angels never fell. They've never experienced grace. And now they want to look into how we as humans are receiving grace. That's an interesting concept. But what about evil angels? Uh, let me take you to this particular passage in Colossians chapter 2. I want to begin reading at verse 13. He says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He's talking to the Colossian believers. And he says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, meaning the Old Testament law, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So even the evil angels have an interest in what God is doing through the gospel. And, and this is specifically talking about that when Christ saved us and he went to the cross, one of the things that he did was he triumphed over the evil angels who would use these other things such as the, the uh, impossibility of obeying the law and so forth uh, to, to pull us down and to hold us back. And so when Paul says back here in uh, Ephesians chapter 3 that God is using the church to make known his manifold wisdom to these high angels, uh, both evil as well as holy angels. Wow. That's interesting if you think about it. Consider this idea. God is using us as his PowerPoint lesson. As the angels are trying to see what it is that God is doing, how God is, is dispensing grace and what grace means in people's lives, the angels are watching us, the holy angels as well as the wicked angels. We are God's uh, object lesson in how these things work. And... Uh, I must admit, I don't necessarily understand how all that goes and, and what it is that God is trying to do as he teaches these things to angels, but it's important to him. And God is using us as the cosmic example of how grace works and how a salvation is procured by faith. What a wonderful thing. And Paul is saying, we need to understand these things. We need to understand that, yes, God has this wonderful plan, but he's using us to show that plan to not just the world, but to the whole cosmos, including the angels and so forth. That's an exciting thing. With that said, Paul goes on to verse 13, and this is the end of his uh, parentheses. It's the end of his digressing from his prayer, because in verse 14, he's going to start praying. But he says here in verse 13, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations, which is your glory. Paul's saying, if all these things are true, do not lose heart. Now, how could we not lose heart? If we were the Ephesian believers and Paul, one of our primary leaders, the one who I, I believe he, he started the church at Ephesus and he's certainly discipling the church at Ephesus and bringing them along and yet he's in prison and he's having the, all these difficulties with not just the authorities but the Judaizers and, and so forth. Wouldn't that cause us to lose heart? But Paul is saying, not if you consider all these things. Think about this for a minute. Since God is revealing a mystery, since you would expect opposition from those who reject it, I mean, isn't, isn't that true? Shouldn't we expect that there's going to be opposition to uh, godly ministry, to biblical ministry, ministry that's showing that Jesus alone for eternal life? Wouldn't you expect that there would be problems about it? Well, yeah, and we see that here with Paul. Since God has saved us in this unexpected way, and since we are the ones that he uses to show forth his great wisdom, we shouldn't lose heart because God is doing something. God is working his plan. We can rejoice 
rather than lose heart. This doesn't have to be something that pulls us way down, but instead we can be happy about it. Now, I think that was one of the secrets to Paul's attitude. While he was in prison, uh, while he endured some of the terrible things that he had to endure that we read about in other places in scripture, but it was because Paul knew God had a plan and God was working it out. Therefore, he could rejoice at those things. Okay, we need to rejoice that God did that with Paul, but that was, what, 2,000 years ago? And we can rejoice that Paul was in prison and that God used prison to further his ministries. I mean, uh, Paul did a lot of writing when he was in prison. He wrote a lot of letters. Maybe those letters wouldn't have gotten written had he not been in prison. Paul had a greater audience. He was able to see uh, world leaders and, and people who were movers and shakers and, and have a ministry to them that he might not have ever have. And, and we're happy about that, that those things happened happened. But that was a long time ago. What about now? Uh, is there anything that ever causes us to lose heart? Think about this. What about your own tribulations? And, and I know some of you have gone through some great tribulations. I know a number of you that have had health issues such as cancer or other things like that. And you've had to endure those things. Some of you have had family tragedy. Uh, some of you have had situations within your family that uh, can get ugly at times and, and you want to get around those. And, and why, why are we going through those tribulations? Yeah, that can make you lose heart. Uh, sometimes your own losses. Uh, what about family members that you have lost? How difficult is that? Especially when it's times when you just can't figure out why we've got to allow that to happen. You think of a, of a, a young mother who has miscarried. And the, the devastation that that can bring and why, what, what purpose could this serve? And you could understand why they would lose heart. Um, you can think of other losses beyond the idea of death. What about business losses? What about, what about failure in business attempts that you've had? Those sorts of things. Why would God allow that? And you could lose heart. A lot of times we lose heart because it's our own lack of insight into what God is doing. Unfortunately, God doesn't always tell us what he's doing. Maybe I should say fortunately, because I don't know that we can handle it in the way that he would want us to. But God has a plan. He's working things out and we can't see it. We can't understand it. I remember talking to someone one time where God was allowing them to be somewhat mistreated by some other people. And I was trying to consider the idea that maybe God has a plan here. And this person said, no, it's not part of God's plan. Those people are just being mean. Well, I still have to believe that it was that person's lack of understanding what God was doing and so forth. So yeah, they can lose heart. But God had a plan in Paul's day and he was working it out. And, and we know that this plan was a wonderful thing where God provided for the salvation of the Gentiles, which is most of us. God has pr provided the salvation for the Gentiles and Jews and, and the opportunity for the whole world to consider the gospel and respond one way or another. That's a wonderful plan. Well, the same God that was working out those plans in Paul's day is alive working out his plans today. God is working out his plans. We don't always know what all that means. We don't always know uh, where that's taking us. And sometimes we have to go through some scary things. But you know what? God is still in control. He's working his plan. And when it's all said and done, we're going to look back and say, oh, this is what God was doing. This is how God was drawing us to this particular place so that we could be where we need to be. Remember the story of Esther where her uncle, I think it was her uncle Mordecai that said to her that uh, maybe you were brought here for this time. This is why you were here. And of course, God did use her for a great deliverance to the Jews in that particular day. But God is working his plan. Consider this COVID-19 pandemic and the uh, quarantine we find ourselves on. What might God be doing? I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I don't know the concrete answer to that, but there's a lot of good suggestions of what might God be doing. Um, it's possible when you think in terms of prophecy that God is setting the stage for his next step. Think about that. God is allowing the world to be conditioned and put in a place so that his next step can happen. That's a possibility. That's exactly what God is doing. Um, it could be that God is giving us an unforeseen ministry opportunity. 
And, and I do believe that that's happening. I've got many friends and churches and other places, and it's so neat to see what their churches are doing and how God is using their efforts to reach out, especially with churches having to go online and do their ministries that way. There's been a lot of people that have been reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ that would not have gone to their churches otherwise. I've heard lots of good stories along that line. And, and I'm excited about that, but God's given us an opportunity that we might not have taken otherwise. Maybe God's just working personally in your life and trying to shape your heart and draw you closer to him so that your faith would be stronger and so that you would, you would walk in the path that he wants you to be walking. Uh, those are all good possibilities. Um, we just need to know that God is working. God does have a plan. And again, when it's all said and done, we're going to look back if he allows us to look back and we're going to say, ah, I see, I can tell what God is doing. But God has a plan. Just like he's working in Paul's life, just like Paul did not want the Ephesians to get uh, too worried about this because God's grand schemes were coming to pass, even though Paul was in prison during this time. Well, we need to understand God is working and uh, we're going to see what he has to do for us. I sometimes like to look at it as an adventure. I like to wonder, I wonder what God's going to do next. I wonder how he's going to pull us through this. I wonder exactly what he's going to do uh, to get us on the other side of this particular hump we're facing. One way or another, God's going to work out his plans. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd help us not to lose heart as we see things happening that we may not understand, that don't seem to make sense for us. Uh, help us to remember, Father, that you are completing what you started. And what you started with, uh, with the apostles and the prophets when the church began, and then through the apostle Paul as he began ministering to the Gentile world, uh, you're going to complete that. And of course, we're part of that all these years later. But help us, Lord, to be able to look at these difficulties we find ourselves in now through the eyes of faith, the eyes that say, God's going to do something. Let's see what it's going to be. Bless us, Father. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sing with us one more time as we sing a song that I know most of you would know. That is the song, Amazing Grace. <laughs> 